Today we mark the last Sunday before Lent, often known as Transfiguration Sunday. Uh, this morning, Ian Wilkes will be preaching, and I'm really looking forward to what he's going to share with us. Remember that the order of service is on the website, where you'll find prayers, readings, the hymns. Also on the website, you'll find a video message uh, for children, as well as an activity that this week is focused on Valentine's Day as Give a Heart Day. That's the day that calls for equitable treatment for Indigenous children, especially in regard to federal funding. A reminder that as I light the community candle, you're invited to light yours as well. So as we begin, I want to offer a word of congratulations to Viola Butler, who turns 105. Wow, what an achievement. Uh, so we'll try and sing this together. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Viola, happy birthday to you. I'd also like to acknowledge that this, we are in the middle of Lunar New Year, so Xing Yan Kuai Le. As important as it is to offer support in times of need, a big part of being a community is, of course, celebrating with one another. And so a big thanks to all who make this their ministry at RHUC, especially the fellowship committee and all the coffee teams. Not meeting in person means that we're hungry for having that time of fellowship together again, just to share some food, have a cup of tea or coffee. Thanks as well to everyone who supports RHUC and MS with offerings made through PAR, through Canada Helps, and by mailing in a check. Now, as we begin, I invite you to get your own candle ready. Today is Sunday, but it's also Valentine's Day, a time to show our loved ones how much we care for them. That caring isn't reserved just for those we know, but is extended out to everyone and everything, each a spark of holy love, each of us a spark of holy love as well. I invite you to light your candle at home. Justice is love in action, and so with a firm commitment to justice, we acknowledge that this church is situated in the traditional territory, the Mississaugas of the Credit. We stand in solidarity with them, as well as with the Chippewas of Georgina Island, our closest First Nations neighbor. And with that same commitment, we seek to be a safer space for everyone, no matter when you were born, where you were from, what language you speak, what you believe, how you identify, or whom you love. Bindigain, benvenuti, isten hozot. And so I invite you now to join with me in our call to worship, inspired by Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. At each day's rising, we see God's goodness revealed in the abundance and glory of life. 
we come in response, ready to worship in awe and gratitude. From season to season, we feel God's presence inviting us to share our love with others. We come in response, ready to serve wherever there is need. Throughout our lives, we seek God's wisdom, growing in openness to transformative grace. We come in response, ready to follow and trusting in Christ. Let us pray. Holy Presence, we draw near seeking to rest in your love and grace. And so we follow Jesus up the mountain where he shimmers in your glory. And you he and hear you proclaim him as your beloved child. We hear the same words echoing within us and feel that same glory embrace us as well. Thank you for these moments that bring us into the heart of life where we can praise you with wonder and with joy. We pray in the name of Jesus, your child and our companion. Amen. And so our hymn is Love Us Into Fullness. If you have a more voices hymn book at home, it's number 81. The words, of course, will be projected on your screen. We take time now to center ourselves through these words of Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Amen. Our first reading is a jump in the narrative thus far, taking us to a pivotal moment as Jesus concludes his ministry in Galilee and shifts his focus on Judah and especially Jerusalem, where he will be arrested and crucified. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 1 to 9 and 14 to 15. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here 
who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach, bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice. This is my son, my beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. Our next reading is a series of excerpts from Ministry with the Forgotten by Dr. Kenneth Carter. Dr. Carter is a retired United Methodist Bishop from the US. For much of his ministry, Dr. Carter felt called to work with people on the margins. This took on a particular meaning when his wife was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia many of his former priorities shifted to the margin. Theology is lived as well as thought. From a biblical and doctrinal perspective, human beings are more than their intellectual capacities. We are bodies endowed with God's breath and God's presence is not limited to our brains or cognition. Implicit theology 
includes embedded practices that have become integral to our living. God's incarnation in Jesus the Christ did not begin with Jesus' public ministry. Jesus' total existence is the Word made flesh. Jesus was the Word made flesh as a whimpering, dependent child with a soiled diaper, as surely as an adult presenting himself for baptism at the Jordan. He was no less the incarnation of God while nursing at Mary's breast than while caring for her in his dying moments. The core of the Christian theology is the practice of love. Christian love is a lived reality, not an abstract intellectual concept. If God is love, then such actions as caring, respectfulness, attentiveness, faithfulness, justice, kindness, and mercy are theological practices. I want to paint you a picture. It was a September. School had only started a few weeks earlier and I was 15 years old. Hurting a bit, a bit jaded to the ways of life. I had been really angry at God, really only attending church for the community, plus normal teenage issues. The ministers had been discussing looking for the face of God in other people and ourselves. But I didn't really understand what that meant or what that even looked like. That was the context in which I was attending Richmond Hill United Church's annual L'Arche service that year. L'Arche aims to provide a supportive and loving community for people with intellectual disabilities and their assistance. And they have communities all over the world, including one right here in Richmond Hill. I had enjoyed the entire service. The music was beautiful, even if I only very awkwardly followed the movements to the hymn, Peace Within You. I was inspired by the radical patience demonstrated during their candle making demonstration. And I was inspired by the people sharing what they loved about the community. It was refreshing to see such uninhibited joy. But the moment that stuck with me in the service even all these years later, was the performance by the Lars Spirit Movers. The Spirit Movers are a dance crew for people with intellectual disabilities and varying physical abilities, as well as their assistants. That day, about a dozen people came up to the front of the sanctuary to dance to a chant-based tune called You Are the Face of God. The lyrics said repeatedly, you are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are the face of God. I remember you could hear a pin drop in the sanctuary. My eyes were glued to a particular man and his assistant in the middle. He was using an electric wheelchair, but he was moving his arms to the beat with the biggest smile on his face and the assistant was gently rotating his chair. And they both had expressions of pure joy on their faces. And it was evident how much they loved each other. And I remember turning to my mom and saying, I get it now. In that moment, I had understood all that my ministers had been discussing. Upon further reflection, it was as if God was calling down to us all and using the words of the Gospel of Mark, saying, these are my children, the beloved, listen to them. In the story we heard today, told by the Gospel of Mark, Jesus chooses his closest companions, his most intimate confidants, to take a rather journey, harrowing journey up the mountain. Anyone who has read about mountain climbing or even climbed a wall knows how difficult it can be. So obviously, the three people Jesus chose were very trusting of him and were probably incredibly invested in his teachings. 
So eventually, the four people arrive on the mountain. And once they got there, Jesus' clothing was transfigured to a blazing white. And then it appears as though Moses and Elijah were there with Jesus. And they were terrified. So Peter, not knowing what to say, wanted to stay there in this euphoric moment. But the others knew this was not possible. And then suddenly, a booming voice, according to the story, spoke down, saying, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Then, as fast as the moment began, the white glow disappeared. The moment was over. But everyone that was there was transformed. In the Bible study I led prior to this sermon, there was considerable discussion about how the transfiguration occurred. There were many compelling theories, but what I believe occurred was, as Marcus Borg described in his book, The Heart of Christianity, what happened was that they experienced what he described as a thin place, which are moments where the barrier between God and us are blurred, where someone can feel God's presence. I would argue that the top of the mountain for those four people held a thin place, just as I had experienced with the spirit movers. It was a moment that both Jesus and the disciples realized that, that Jesus was a child of God and the beloved. It affirmed for them that Jesus's teachings were correct. Now, I empathize with the disciples a lot in this story. I imagine the terror they felt in that moment when Jesus' clothes turned to blazing white, or when Moses and Elijah appeared. This serves us as a reminder that these moments of transformation can be very scary, that you can never go back to the way that things were before. But I also empathize with Peter, wanting to stay on that mountain forever for wanting the euphoric moment to stay forever. Now, reading this story, I find myself wondering what this meant for the disciples to find out that Jesus, their teacher, was a beloved. I wonder how this knowledge changed them. I imagine that it was empowering to know that they were following the right pathway. And I wonder if this moment gave the disciples the necessary courage to follow Jesus. As we recall from earlier passages in the Gospels, when the disciples joined Jesus, he told them that the life of the disciple was hard and difficult, that it was not the life of ease. I wonder if this transformation was part of the catalyst for their devotion. Was this transfiguration needed to, for them to join Jesus in working to change an oppressive regime? A question that is worth us wrestling with that was brought up in the Bible study was, do we need a sensational moment in order to follow someone seeking to change the world? Or should we look for smaller moments to prove that they are beloved so that we may listen to them and help change the world? Realizing that the members of L'Arche Daybreak were beloved children changed me. Slowly, I noticed that I strove to be more patient, more compassionate with people who do not act like me. But most significantly, I realized that all people with disabilities are beloved children of God, that those who do not look or act like me are beloved children of God. And this was a catalyst for a passion for social justice. Led to me attending a university where I felt that justice and diversity were passioned. To seek mentorship within the Regina Anti-Poverty Ministry. And to work at March of Dimes Canada. Where I was privileged to be a part of a coalition to strengthen the Accessible Canada Act which finally passed in 2019. I also wonder what this moment meant to Jesus, to realize that he was beloved. When Jesus was transfigured, he did not stay on the mountain 
holding on to the euphoric moment as many would have been tempted. Instead, he went down the mountain back to the crowds to an imperfect world in need of change. And later on, in a part of the passage we did not hear, he went to heal a child. Knowing that he was beloved, he chose to give to others, to devote himself to the betterment of our world. I find myself wondering if Jesus thought about the transfiguration during the Holy Week narrative from the euphoria of the crowds all the way to his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. I wonder if it gave him courage to face the crowds, to overturn the tables when he felt forsaken, arrested, and crucified. To apply this to us, I look to the book, The Ministry with the Forgotten by Dr. Kenneth Carter. And he argues that we have an implicit theology which develops over the course of our lives and is based on the beliefs that we develop. The most important force he argues that shapes an implicit theology is seeing love acted out in the world, to be loved and to show love. So, Believing you are a beloved child of God can shape your implicit theology, which influences the way in which you see the world and how you love others in the world. Sometimes the process of, of coming to this realization that you are a beloved child of God to lead to transformation comes in the midst of suffering. And an anonymous phone call with the host of the podcast, Beautiful Stories from Anonymous People, Chris Gathered, a woman describes her daughter's journey with childhood illness. The little girl needed considerable surgery, and when she was recovering, she received an outpouring of love from her family, friends, nurses, doctors, staff, and strangers. So one day, while her daughter was recovering, the caller looked over to the girl's whiteboard in the room, and it had been filled with loving messages from everybody, including strangers. And in the middle of this whiteboard, the little girl wrote in six-year-old handwriting, love is everywhere. And while nobody pretends that this is the kind of journey you want, the mother and daughter were transformed and able to find moments of joy because they are loved. They received moments of unexpected kindness from strangers and they sought to pass that on to others, including collaborating with nonprofits to improve medical care for children, to improve research into the disease that the daughter had, so working beyond themselves, trying to keep her daughter healthy, to also help other children. So, I ask you, how would you be changed if you discovered that your annoying neighbor, a person struggling with addiction, the slow driver that you cannot pass, someone who doesn't look like you, the person who hurts you, or a person whose values you would horror is also a child of God and the beloved, how would you treat them? Would you work to be changed by them? Would you seek to join in a communion with them, to be prepared to listen to them? I ask you, how would you live your life if you knew that you are a beloved child of God? What injustices would you address? How would you spend your days? How would you be changed? What would still be precious to you? Would you live your life boldly and without shame? I ask you, where do you need to look 
to be transformed today. Amen. And now we will sing our hymn from More Voices, number 161, I Have Called You By Your Name. The words will be shown on your screen, or you can follow along in your hymn book. Jesus welcomed all to share meals with him. In open fellowship, Jesus made it known that all people shine with the light of God's love. Here at this and many tables across our community, we express that same gift of light and love surrounding and renewing us. God is here. God is within and around us. Open your hearts. We gladly open them to all that is holy. Let us give thanks. It is good to give thanks and praise. It is good to give thanks to you, maker of heaven and earth. You are the source of both the infinite and the infinitesimal. Light blazed forth from your splendor and the cosmos was born. Stars and quasars, planets and moons, and the gift of life in all its dazzling array. Among the living, you made and called humankind, imprinting upon us your beloved image and calling us to bear your presence in the world. Too often we hid your image within us, and yet you continue to invite us into relationship and fulfilled your mission by calling a people for yourself and sending them to bear your light in the world. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in God's name. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to you and blessed is your child Jesus 
whom you sent in your name. In him we see the fullness of your glory revealed in human form. Declaring the nearness of your kingdom, he healed the sick, forgave sinners, raised the dead, helping all who met him to see once again your beloved image within them. Knowing his last journey to Jerusalem would test them all, he took his closest friends up a high mountain where, in a moment of grace, you pulled back the veil of heaven and revealed your light shining through him. We catch a glimpse of that same glory now as we gather together in his memory. We remember especially the night before his death, when he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup. Gave thanks to you, gave it to them saying, drink from this, all of you. This is the sign of the new covenant. Eat and drink in memory of me. And so in his memory, we offer you our work and our lives, living out his death and resurrection, called in his name to be a source of transforming love in your world. Open our hearts then to the gift of your Holy Spirit present here, made known through bread and wine. Make them to be for us the living presence of your beloved child, that we too may be his beloved. Make us one with him and each other, one in ministry to all the world. Holy One, we give you praise. Creator God, we praise you through your word made flesh in the power of your life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare to share communion, we pray that not only we may be spiritually fed, but there may be daily bread for everyone. And so we pray together. O oh God, you love us like a good parent and are present in every aspect of our existence. May your nature become known and respected by all. May your joy, peace, wholeness, and justice be the reality for everyone as we live by the Jesus way. Give us all that we really need to live every day for you. And forgive us our failures as we forgive others for their failures. Keep us from doing those things which are not of you. And cause us always to be centered on your love. For you are the true reality in this our now and in all our future. Amen. And so, friends, I invite you now to pick up the bread before you. We share the bread of life, a gift of hope for all. I invite you to pick up your cup. We share the fruit of the vine, a promise of love for all. I invite you to join with me in our prayer after communion. Gift of grace and goodness, 
We give thanks that we have been refreshed at your table through the illuminating presence of your beloved child, Jesus. Also called to be your beloved children, send us forth to shine with your peace and love, rejoicing always in your Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we join together in singing, Arise, Your Light Has Come. If you have a hymn book at home, it is Voices United, number 93. Otherwise, of course, the words are projected on your screen. I invite you to join with me now in our blessing. As we go forth from here, may we be strong in spirit, courageous in will and gentle of heart. Each day may our actions be rooted in wisdom, nurtured by hope and open to love. May we meet others as we would wish to be met with a heart of compassion and a spirit of healing and grounded in joy. So friends, following the postlude, uh, the Zoom rooms will remain open, followed by a uh, time to be in smaller groups in breakout rooms. Uh, this being Transfiguration Sunday means, of course, that Lent is next Sunday, which means that Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Uh, so there will be an, uh, an online service uh, via Zoom uh, on Wednesday at 7.15 p.m. You can get the link from Deb. And as well, we'll see you online next Sunday at 1030.